Yes, all right. Um, as I said, um, the best introduction I can give is that um, I share the same passion as you all do, which is we don't like mosquitoes, right? So, so for multiple reasons, either being in Atlanta or because of the public health problem that they present, uh, my research in a way addresses the challenge of, uh, you know, the pathogens they transmit and the nuisance they generate through a, an environmentally conscious approach. Um, and I'll talk to you about that um, as I go today. Um, I, I'd be happy to take any questions, you know, at the end, if there's something in the middle that also captures your attention, you know, I, I'm more than happy to address it. Uh, but the idea today is really uh, give you a, a bit of a mosquito 101, you know, some basics about why they're one of the most uh, evolved species that actually, you know, attack us and many other uh, mammals. Um, and then talk to you about one specific species, uh, Aedes aegypti, which is the, the main vector of Zika um, and the challenges we have globally to control it. Um, and then I'll tell you some of the, the, the approaches we're following. Uh, no promises of mosquitoes on Zoom, but I might show you one or two um, on, on, on my journey. Um, and then at the end, just uh, some, some methods that uh, my group has been uh, developing over the years that are really um, kind of the new frontier of, of research in, in many areas. Um, and I'll start with this photo because people tend to think of mosquitoes as these ugly pests that annoy you. And they can be quite beautiful too, right? Um, so this is actually a mosquito from here in the US. Um, and what makes it really interesting is that the larva of this species eats other mosquito larvae. So some researchers have used them as biological control mosquitoes, because if you grow them in your yard, they could eat the larva of the mosquitoes that might be annoying you. And the reason why is because these guys do not feed on blood. They just feed on nectar. Um, so mosquitoes are quite diverse. And, and the reason why I study them, uh, my background is in ecology. So I'm really interested in the interaction between uh, you know, organisms, the environment, and humans. Um, so the reason why we really study them um, is because if you start making the tally of how many humans die by different animals, you know, you can think of shark attacks. Um, there's this really nice graphic that the Gates Foundation put together where they show that the world's deadliest animal by far is the mosquito. And the reason why is because mosquitoes not only annoy you and, and, and get your blood, but also carry many many pathogens, um, many of those who we actually we do not know, we're still discovering them uh, as we speak. Um, and because of that, and, and that ability they have to carry a pathogen that would affect humans or you know, other vertebrates, uh, mosquitoes are defined as vectors. And, and this is a, a busy slide, but keep in mind that vectors are a big group of organisms. And the main purpose is that these are insects or, or ticks, you know, which also are part of the, the same group, um, that they, what they have in common is that they carry a pathogen that would be either injected, and that's the most common, but not necessarily. Sometimes they're a bit more uh, uh, complicated, like kissing bugs that carry Chagas disease that actually carry the parasite in their feces. So it's a bit more complicated process, but the idea is they vector the pathogen to humans, and sometimes humans are just one component of, of the transmission cycle. Um, and as you can see uh, here, you know, we have birds and domestic animals and, and others. So, so it is a complicated system. Um, and, and just to give you a bit of background, mosquitoes are, you know, you can go back to movies at uh, Jurassic World and it's one of those very old and ancient species that have evolved uh, over many, many millions of years to, to feed on, on blood. Um, and the reason why is because the blood gives them all the amino acids and nutrients they need to lay their eggs. Um, so of the 3,530 species that are roughly known, for most of them, they, there is a need for the females to feed on blood. But what's really interesting is that male mosquitoes do not feed on blood, they actually feed on neck. Um, and also what's interesting from this very large number of species, only a hundred of them are really carrying any pathogen that would make us sick. Um, so it's a small fraction 
And for most of the, the part, you know, the, the other species uh, do not even get interested in us. They, they evolve to bite uh, other mammals, uh, birds, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what makes it really important, and, and for me, and for us being in the Department of Environmental Sciences, is that mosquitoes are an environmental hazard. You know, and the reason why is because they have this dual life where half of their time they spend it in the water. So they need to breed in different containers, sometimes, you know, trash, uh, tires, you know, even small cups of water would be enough for them. And because they, they develop in those water containers, uh, when they emerge, you know, they're ready to, to feed on blood and then they fly, find people, and then they complete the cycle by getting back into a water habitat. So because of this dependence on, on, on this type of containers, the environment that we generate, you know, in urban areas is crucial for their expansion. And, and what we've seen over the, the, the last centuries is a rapid expansion of many mosquitoes, particularly in urban areas. We're making habitat for them. Um, so what we do in my lab is uh, we try to understand that mosquitoes are just a small bit in a complicated puzzle. And in order for them to tra transmit and carry pathogens to humans, we really have to look at them within uh, their biology and their complexity, but also in their interaction with the pathogens they carry and, and some of the evolution that happens in, in that interaction. Also the human component, as you'll see in, in some slides farther along, but primarily in this big bubble, the environment that surrounds. So we cannot study mosquitoes in the lab and assume that what we know in the lab would be translated to your backyard. Um, and that's why a lot of what we do in my group is really engage students and take them out, get them dirty, if you wanna say that word, um, you know, look for the reservoirs of some of these viruses, look for the habitats where they grow, uh, have fun at the same time. And just to give you an idea, we not only work on mosquitoes, but we also work on ticks. And I can talk to you about uh, later, we just got some funding from USDA to study an invasive tick that made it into the US and Georgia. Um, but also what we do is we, we, we spend time in the lab. Uh, my students, we have a, a 20 plus people lab here and we you know, bring the specimens, we the studies and also involve a lot of quantitative methods. So we try to cover all, all the different um, array of uh, options uh, but keeping in mind that this is a, you know, a very important mission for me is that in order for me to have impact, I don't care that much what the impact factor of a paper is, uh, is how can we also help and, and reach out to those who are in most need, particularly in tropical uh, poor areas. So we work a lot with communities and, and my hope is basically to bridge, you know, the science and policy by engaging as, as it was mentioned in many panels, um, I was actually last week training in Puerto Rico um, on, on how to do mapping of mosquitoes and Zika. So, so we get involved in, in, in different areas. And again, it's, it's quite insightful when you turn research into policy and have discussions that are more uh, related to budgets and, and, and needs than just biology. But, but anyhow, so that's a bit of me. And, and what I'll do now is talk to you about this, this creature. This is Aedes aegypti. This is a mosquito that. Um, it's found pretty much in most urban areas in the tropics and subtropics. It was found in Atlanta uh, for a long time and, and, and luckily was eliminated. But we can find it a couple hours south in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, you know, there's populations of this guy. And what happens with this mosquito is that it is really adapted to live with humans. And it's a close relative of the mosquito that you have right now in your yards, which is the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus. But what happens with Aedes aegypti is that it has evolved to primarily feed on humans. So if you put a dog next to it, it's going to go bite you. And because of that and how frequently uh, they feed, these mosquitoes actually are really efficient at transmitting viruses. Um, and also because they, they take about a week to grow from egg to adult, so they have many generations in, in, a, in a given month or summer, uh, they are constantly evolving and challenging our ability to control. Um, what's really unique about this mosquito is that it, it grows in small containers. So anything that look, looks like this, you know, plas plastic buckets, your bird feeder, um, 
small leaves that accumulate water, they are really the key habitat for them. So controlling them is not just as simple as it looks, although uh, the reasons why this mosquito has been the target for many years of, of mosquito control um, in the US and globally. And the reason why is because this Aedes aegypti mosquito is the primary vector of a virus called yellow fever. And if you wanna go back in history and you like, you could read a lot about the history of yellow fever in the South in, in, in the United States, because you know, as you see this sign in Savannah, um, one of the main killers at that time in the 1800s was not the flu, you know, it was yellow fever. Um, and if you're scared about COVID-19, you know, SARS-CoV-2 uh, with its lethality, well, yellow fever kills about 30% of the people who get it. So it's a really deadly uh, uh, virus. And although we contained it, uh, the history of, uh, you know, public health was in a way associated with yellow fever and Aedes aegypti. Um, and what's really interesting about this species is that the, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Pan American Health Organization in the 1930s organized one of the most comprehensive uh, programs for controlling and eradicating a species. And the idea was to, you know, the only way for, for the world to get rid of yellow fever was to eradicate the Aedes aegypti mosquito. So this campaign in the 30s, imagine people wearing like this, very organized um, in terms of the structure almost inherited from the military. Uh, they used to go house by house and treat all the areas with insecticides where the mosquito was breeding. Um, and at that time, the only tool they had was DDT. And by applying DDT around the vases, not in the vases, but around where the mosquitoes breed, this program achieved one of the most remarkable uh, containments of a vector species at a continental level. So this is, although the, the vector was all over the continent, uh, by 1970, more than 30 years after this was implemented, you know, very few areas remained with the vector. A vaccine for yellow fever was developed and programs relaxed uh, a lot of their uh, structures. Uh, and with that, the mosquito recolonized. So in 2002, as you can see, pretty much looks like you know, the gains of, of mosquito control were all lost. And actually the mosquito expanded even farther than its original range. So because of that, um, you know, researchers started studying why, why is that this mosquito colonized um, the world so rapidly after the 70s. Um, and one of the main causes, one of the main explanations is that it's not that the mosquito colonized, is that we made more habitat for them. And, and if you look at this, this figure here in the 1970s, this is the share of the population in the Americas uh, that are either urban in, in red or that are rural in green. And as you can see, since the 70s, the Americas has expanded in its urban population. And places in Brazil look like this. And you know that urbanization combined with rapid growth, irregular water supply, the you know, rapid and, and, and indiscriminate availability of plastics that are the main habitat for the mosquitoes created in a way the perfect storm for the mosquitoes. Um, now, what happened was that from 70s to about 1990, you know, mosquito was expanding, but there was no yellow fever because there was a vaccine. So what really changed the map of mosquito-borne diseases in the Americas was that as the mosquito expanded, new viruses emerged and invaded. And the first one was dengue. Dengue is called bone breaker fever. It's really painful, it won't kill you, but people who got it say, you don't wanna have it. It's worse than anything they had. A um, lot of pain, you know, a lot of disability associated with it. Dengue is a really big problem all over the Americas and it's transmitted by this Egypta. In about nine, uh, 2014, 15, another virus, chikungunya, also produces altralgia, really it's a debilitating uh, virus, invaded the Americas, and now it's pretty much uh, distributed across the whole continent. And finally, in 2016, a new virus called Zika, which is probably the one that you heard the most, invaded the continent, including the US. So, so we have moved now from yellow fever to what we call 80s transmitted or 80s born viruses. 
And, and the continent now at any given time could have one or all of the viruses being transmitted by one mosquito. So it makes sense to think that if we control one mosquito, you control three viruses because developing vaccines for each one of these pathogens is taking more and more time than, than we hold because of their complexity um, uh, and the immunological uh, challenges that they, they produce. Um, but the real challenge for us has been Zika. And that's when my lab got really involved uh, because Zika not only produced that debilitating um, signs and, and symptoms on people, but also this devastating malformation in, in newborns, particularly when the mother got infected on the first trimester. And, and because of that, the world was in a way caught off guard the same way that we got caught off guard with, with COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2. Um, by the time you know, the virus was detected, you know, people were giving birth to, to babies with this uh, uh, but, but what's really interesting about Zika is that Zika was a pandemic. It was silent and slow, uh, but it was really propagating uh, pretty much since 2013, although it was first detected in 2007. And what's interesting about Zika is that the origins are Africa, a forest in Africa, actually it's called Zika forest. That's where the virus was first described. And many, many years ago, the virus jumped from primates to humans and, and monkey and, and, and the urban mosquito Aedes aegypti, and then it crawled to the Pacific and around 2015 made it to the Americas. And once it made it to Americas, in, in less than a year, it propagated continents. So it was a really uh, big problem. And what was really interesting about Zika is that not only caught us off guard, but also uh, by the time Zika hit, the world didn't know what to do well. So programs in, 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 in many countries, and you've seen many of these images probably, were doing what they were doing to control dengue. And, and the main conclusion was, well, we were not very effective at controlling dengue with these traditional methods. And these methods involve fogging from the street. Um, you know, what this cloud shows are insecticides that are just dumped into the environment um, with what we know a very limited impact on the mosquitoes. Um, so my work on our lab, what we've been doing is challenging this idea that business as usual um, is the right way to control an urban mosquito-borne disease because the evidence of this method is, is very limited. And, and two pieces of evidence that we brought to also indicate why this method of control is very uh, uh, poor uh, came from data on, on the mosquitoes and the humans themselves. Um, so keep in mind that when Zika or dengue or these viruses are in one area, what ministries of health do is they detect a human case they look at the address where they live, they send a pickup truck and just fog the entire block and maybe a couple blocks around. So they are reacting to human detected cases. Now, what we found is that these two factors, insecticide resistance and human movement are crucial in explaining the, the lack of uh, efficacy of these methods. Um, and some colleagues from, from um, a, a group that researchers insecticide resistance did this really nice analysis. They look for papers publishing data on mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, and, and resistance, and, and map where the, the reports came from. So keep in mind that here, red is bad. It means that mosquitoes, if you apply a chemical, they're going to survive. So they're not dying. And what they found is that pretty much continentally, we have a major issue, including the US, by the way. Um, not that much in Africa. And one of the reasons is because a lot of these uh, resistance is coming from the mode of application. And in Africa, dengue, uh, Zika, they're not a big problem. So mosquito control is not really targeting those mosquitoes. They're targeting malaria and, and other types of pests. Um, so what we started looking is, well, is it only that this type of control affects uh, uh, the mosquitoes and, and is forcing them to evolve? Uh, we actually found, we did some studies in, in, in Mexico, we found that the actual reason why we have such widespread resistance is a combination of what the ministries of health are doing and also what people are doing in their houses. In many of these tropical areas, maybe it's the same for you. You can go to Home Depot, you can go to the store and buy some insecticides to kill ants, roaches, etc. And people use these 
control mosquitoes. They spray them in the air in one room and close the room and um, you know, let it be for a while. Um, now, what we found is that that's not generally done. People do not know how to apply these insecticides well. And we did a study finding with mosquitoes that we know are resistant to, to, resistant to these chemicals uh, that we have in the lab and mosquitoes that we know that are susceptible, we actually took two types of insecticides that are the most commonly used in households and apply them the right way inside a bedroom. And what we found is that for mosquitoes, when they're resistant, about 50% of them would survive and the rest would die. When, when they're susceptible, of course, all of them would die. Moreover, what we also found is that the survivors, so those mosquitoes here in the resistant area that survived, most of them were what we call homozygote resistant. So they're actually the, 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 the superbugs of mosquitoes. And because of that, what this application is doing is in a way creating a bottleneck for selection, for evolution, and forcing a very rapid, um, in a way, uh, selection of those individuals who would survive uh, the intervention. Now the Minister of Health goes to the house at a later, later time. So then this combination of insecticide resistance was one that led us to think that maybe applying something randomly as a cloud uh, and an insecticide for which mosquitoes might be susceptible is not a very smart way to do it. Um, and the other one that also challenges this idea of reactive control is something tied to this Aedes, Aedes aegypti mosquito that I didn't tell you, tell you which is unlike the, the mosquitoes that carry area, this one and the same one that bites in, in your backyard, they're active during the day. So it really doesn't matter where you sleep. And that's why a bed net, which is what's used for malaria, has no use for dengue or Zika, because it's not where people sleep where the problem is. <clears throat> so over the last uh, decade, you know, my group, we've been really working with colleagues to understand how human mobility, how behavior uh, of people within cities would shape the transmission of, of these viruses. And the idea is very simple. If, ministries of health are taking your home address and doing mosquito control at your house, and then you actually got infected somewhere else, then they're wasting effort, even if the intervention will be very effective. Um, so we did many studies, but there's one image that probably will show you how important human mobility is in urban areas. And, and what we did was in, 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 in a city in the middle of the Amazon in Peru called Iquitos, we had a, a really long uh, and large NIH funded project uh, to look at human behavior and, and dengue. And for that study, what we did is we gave people a GPS tracker, it's not a phone, but just a data logger that looked like this. And this was password protected. We had all the IRB compliance that we needed to do it. And, and people carry that for two weeks on their neck. And we had these units being set up so to, they turn on only during the daytime. <clears throat> So we had about 600 people and that gave us uh, information because they were storing the data every two and a half minutes. Uh, so they were that unit for two weeks. Uh, so we got about 2.5 million data points of all the places they've been to. And when we mapped them, we actually felt uh, amazed because uh, the black dots indicate where those 600 people lived and the yellow indicates where the movements uh, were tracked. And as you can see, you could be living in these two neighborhoods, but you pretty much are finding that those people are moving throughout most of the city. And now these are just rivering visits. So they, they might have a farm or somewhere outside, but most of the movement happens inside the city and also traveling south to another town. Um, so from the perspective of ministries of health now, if I'm going to the house of this person, uh, maybe infection happens somewhere else. So it's not that effective to do that control. So maybe what we have to do is think of methods that are either applied to their house or maybe methods that might be able to cover the entire geography of where people are moving, right? Uh, instead of just clouds of insects. Um, and that is something that uh, in a way has been the need for a long time. And what happened with Zika is I was part of a, a committee called VCAC, Vector Control Advisory Group. And what we were doing on that uh, committee at the time when Zika emerged was not only to create some recommendations of what countries could do, 
but also provide information about the need for evidence-based vector control. And what that means is the same level of uh, scrutiny that a vaccine is receiving now as we speak for, for uh, you know, therapeutics for COVID, let's say, um, we need to have the same level of standards for mosquito-borne disease control. Um, and what we did is created a, a framework for explaining researchers and policymakers how we quantify the epidemiological impact of vector control. That means not how many mosquitoes it kills, but also how many cases of disease they prevent. And that was a missing piece of evidence for fogging and for many of the methods that were used before Zika. We didn't have the evidence to support or tell countries what to do or not to do. Um, so in my second part of this talk, I'm going to show you some of the things we're doing here at Emory and leading in a way um, to elevate that evidence base. And we'll start with some of the classic, and I call classic because it involves you know, insecticides and in a classic approach, and then some of the new approaches are trying to cover some of the gaps we're seeing and even some of the applications for, for the mosquitoes in your backyard. Um, and as I told you, this is how insecticide applications happen in most of the trucks. Tracks, clouds of insecticide. Um, now, if you think about these, what you have to do is this insecticide has to travel where the mosquitoes are. And the mosquitoes are going to be inside the house. So we need not only this cloud, but also windows to be open, right? Now, we did a study uh, in more than a thousand houses in Mexico where we went into the houses and, and with this vacuum that you know, we invented here in the lab, it's called the Procopac, I can tell you all about it, but it's really a, an efficient way of collecting mosquitoes that are resting. So it's basically a, a mosquito vacuum. Any mosquito resting there is going to be sucked and kept in a collection cup. And what we did is we stratified our collections by room and also by height, you know, high and low. And what we found is that most of the mosquitoes were in, inside the house, not outside, at least for Aedes aegypti. Number two, there's a 17 time uh, fall uh, chance of finding mosquitoes below 1.5 meters. So if you extend your arm, think about most of the mosquitoes are going to be below that line. And that's the same for the mosquito that bites in your backyard, Aedes albopictus. So we're finding that behaviorally, they go and bite on your ankles, on your legs, and that's why they follow this very secretive uh, um, way of flight and also behavior. So then sending a cloud of insecticide from the outside and expecting it's going to reach inside this cabinet, you know, below the TV or even you know, behind the TV, um, maybe it's, a, it's a over ambitious, right? Um, so one of the things we've been researching for over a decade it's an approach that is similar to what many, many of you may be doing in your house, which is pest control. So you have, it's named Orkin, goes to your house uh, and maybe controls roaches by applying in spots uh, that they know where roaches are going to be found. Um, so that method, it, we call it targeted indoor residual spraying because we're gonna be using an insecticide that could, if you apply it in a surface, it would last months, not just weeks. Or, or, or hours, which is what happens with that cloud of insecticide that is sent from the track. It's just ephemeral, it does not. And what we did just to test this method initially, you know, I have a, I rent houses long-term in, in, in the Yucatan. We have nine houses that I call experimental because they're empty, but we screen them. We have double door, we have screen windows. So in these houses, we can do different approaches of controlling mosquitoes. We can, in this case, what we did is spray the whole wall, like that's what's done for malaria. Then we decided to spray just half the wall. And finally, just where the places where the mosquitoes might be resting, which is under these dark um, locations. And what we found is if now you release mosquitoes at given time points, one day, 14 days, one month, all the way to six months, we can release them and go back 24 hours later and, and just count how many are alive, how many are dead. So we released about a hundred of them. And what we found is that no matter how you spray for about two months, it doesn't really matter because the mosquitoes all die, which means mosquitoes are flying into this location and going, flying underneath this plastic location, touching the insecticide and being impacted. That, the reason why we call this targeted is because we're just targeting the application in the resting sites, not in the indiscriminate entire wall of, of the house. Um, 
And what we found with this method, you know, and advising the Australian government was that we could estimate how good would it be at controlling dengue. And, and the reason why is because in Australia, they apply this method for outbreak control. Um, what they do is, and this is the method that we recommended and the CDC applied in, 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 in Florida when Zika invaded one of the neighborhoods. But the idea is you do contact tracing. So somebody is sick, you ask them where they've been last 15 days, as we do now for COVID, and then the Minister of Health goes to those locations and do this uh, spot application that basically lasts about three to five minutes per house. So it's very quick. Uh, but the insecticide will last for about three months uh, in this case. Um, so they had an outbreak and well, by counting, you know, how many dengue cases were in houses that were sprayed versus not, we were able to actually quantify what's called the epidemiological impact of this method. We calculated that by saying what percentage of cases were found in the houses that were not treated, and you see this goes up over time, versus the houses that were treated. Right? If the method wouldn't be effective, you would see this dash line to be very similar to the control, that there's no effect. But we see a very rapid reduction over time. So that means the method, TIRS, is preventing future cases of dengue when in the places where it's applied. And by doing some math and, and some calculations, we were able to calculate what we call the effectiveness, which is the proportion of cases that are prevented compared to the control. And the number you have to look is this one here. So this method, TIRS, we found that is 86% effective. So that's the reduction in cases you would have compared to doing nothing, in this case, uh, in, in the control houses. And if we account for this early period, which is the first 10 days, uh, which we don't know if these cases could have been exposed before the application, you know, the intervention would have an effectiveness of 96%. To give you an idea, the, the, this is mind blowing in terms of efficacy. You know, we're above and beyond any vaccine uh, that was tested for dengue um, at that time. So there's a lot of promise for, for this method, but there was a challenge. This was done in Australia. So one of the things we did with all this evidence, you know, I'm the PI of a big uh, phase three uh, randomized control trial that is funded by the NIH. Um, and doing these type of studies is very challenging. Imagine that we have to now go into houses, treat them with the insecticide, have a control group that doesn't receive the intervention. There's not enough transmission in the US to do it. So we're doing this in, in the Yucatan. And this funding is about $7 million that we got to basically collaborate with the CDC, you know, with different institutions, uh, including the federal government of Mexico, to really generate this evidence on epidemiological impact. And again, the project is ongoing. We just finishing the first transmission season. And what we're doing is looking at different clusters within the city of Merida, which by the way, recommend you visiting if you have a chance with COVID so it's a beautiful town, but in, in the Southern part, outside the downtown where the touristy areas are, Dengue is, is quite prevalent. So in those areas, we decided, we, we selected clusters that will receive the intervention and that won't receive the intervention. And what we're doing is monitoring uh, 4,600 children over three years to monitor, you know, whether we see a, a reduction in, in, in their infection. Um, some preliminary data we are finding from the first um, study, you know, this is for mosquitoes. And this is how many mosquitoes you get in the control group. And this is how many mosquitoes you get in the, in the treatment group. So we're seeing about 62% reduction in mosquitoes. But what's really interesting is that the mosquitoes that are here, you know, in orange, those who are surviving the intervention, they're actually coming from outside. What we're seeing is that we're modifying the age of the mosquitoes. We're getting them to be younger. And as they become younger, they cannot transmit the virus because they need about seven to 10 days to incubate the virus. So the epidemiological impact that we expect might be similar to what we're seeing in Australia. Um, so the evidence is strong and what we're doing, and this is really a key partnership that I have and, and the Emory College has with the Pan American Health Organization. So we're engaged with the Ministry of Health, directly with the Ministry of Health of Mexico, Hugo lopez Gatel is the, the Under Secretary of Health, and he's not, not only aware of the project, but also willing to implement it uh, nationwide. 
And at the same time, what we're doing is generating these. This is a book that we created with the Pan American Health Organization. We provide a manual of application. If a country wants to do this, how would they do it? Um, and one of the exciting news I want to share with you is that part of this big collaboration, now we have a, a signed uh, memorandum of understanding between the Pan American Health Organization and, and Emory College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and that MOU is providing these opportunities that I mentioned for training in Puerto Rico, but also a lot of internship and research opportunities for students who are going to be visiting countries and helping them um, gain experience then, but also helping the countries um, in some of the mission of mosquito control. Um, now, a few minutes before I end, I'll spend in the new, what new technologies we have out there. Um, and many of you uh, have probably over the years, especially when, when you were little, have used uh, coils, burning coils to get rid of mosquitoes. Um, sorry, you know, or, or in a, a more uh, modern approach, these plugins. Um, so those are methods that uh, basically still use an insecticide, but through a method that the WHO has defined spatial repellency. And the idea is, you know, a topical repellent is something you put on your skin, like DEET, uh, off. But this is a spatial repellent because the idea is that you have a chemical that now that is going to create a bubble and repel mosquitoes to enter the house because, you know, the, the chemical is not on your skin, which is not fun, especially some people who react to it. And the, the chemical is in, in the air. Um, so these are safe. There's plenty of evidence, you know, about uh, how they work. One of them is called transfluthrin. The other one is called metofluthrin. And, and research from colleagues in Peru found that this method prevents about 35, 34% uh, dengue cases in, in, in Peru. So what we've been doing, I don't know if I can show you the camera, but so we're using a new prototype and this was developed to us by Sumitomo. Um, and what we're doing now is changing the paradigm. Instead of using something that you burn, Right, like you see here, that needs electricity or creates fumes, and people with asthma might suffer. There is a mesh that has a polyurethane, and embedded in the mesh, there is this metofluthrin, this, this um, active ingredient. And what's nice of this prototype is that you can hang it in one room, as you see here, and, and basically for about three weeks, that room would have um, you know, a level of protection preventing mosquito entry and also behavior like biting and things like that. Um, so we tested that unit in the Yucatan in Mexico. And again, imagine that we have a group of houses here in blue that didn't get the units and a, a group of houses in, in red that did get them. And what we can see is number of mosquitoes inside the house in the control versus the treatment houses. When you do the math, it gives about 60 to 70% reduction. In, in how many mosquitoes would enter the house. But most importantly, inside the house, you know, if the device is on, it confuses the mosquitoes. It actually uh, is not something that would kill them because it's, it's, it's not meant to do that. It confuses them, so then they won't bite. And, and what we're seeing is if now you go inside the house and sit exposed to your arm for a few minutes, you'll find that in the control houses, the mosquitoes are going to be landing. So 14 landings in one person in five, in, in, in five minutes versus in the control, in the treatment area, in the black ones, landings at different times go down dramatically to the point that we have 90% reduction in landings. So this method, again, is meant to be less intrusive. People don't have to turn it on, it's just there. Um, and of course, it, it would hopefully be made a, a, affordable. Um, now, related to your, maybe some of the questions you might have, we tested these units also here in the backyard. So my best laboratory is Baker Woods in, in Atlanta and on Emory campus. Uh, so we do a lot of studies with my students there. And, and again, what we did here is for Aedes albopictus, which is a mosquito, Asian tiger mosquito that bites you outside when you're gardening, you know, during the day, when you're walking. Um, we, we, we had different tests, but one of them, the simplest one, is just sitting next to the device or putting it in close proximity. And again, gray area shows, you know, when you don't have the emanator, green shows the number of landings and do of mosquitoes, um, something when here. you have the emanator, and we're finding that it reduces about 89.5, almost 90% uh -huh. 
number of landings indoors. To share sound, I'll so show you the new method. method. So this is a future new new technology. I think it's it's a uh, it's very young still, but there's a lot of potential for developing, and this evidence provides justification for innovation in in new chemicals and fibers. Um, and finally, I'm going to go um, to show you a bit of um, see if. Uh, the deadliest animal in the world kills more people each year than every other animal combined, makes hundreds of millions of people sick, and is half the length of a staple. It's the mosquito. And a lot of mosquitoes are bad bugs, like one species, Aedes aegypti. These bad bugs bite, and these bad bugs breed. They're an invasive species that spreads diseases like Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya, Diseases that stop people from working and going to school. Most of these diseases don't have effective vaccines. So that means we have to stop the bad bugs. Except pesticides can be toxic and clearing standing water is not enough because people can never find all the places that bad bugs live. So they almost always come back, biting and breeding. We need a better way to stop the bad bugs. Luckily, there are good bugs. They're the same kind of mosquito, but good bugs can't bite. Good bugs can't breed. And most importantly, good bugs can stop bad bugs. How? Well, nature, with a little bit of science mixed in. You raise mosquitoes that have a naturally occurring bacteria that makes it so they can't breed with bad bugs. Then you separate the males, because male mosquitoes can't bite. Then when you release those males into the wild, they find bad bugs to mate with but their eggs won't hatch because of the bacteria in the good bug. So the next generation gets smaller and smaller and smaller until all the bugs are practically gone. And unlike other methods, good bugs are harmless and they naturally know exactly where to find bad bugs because they're, you know, bugs. Pretty good, right? Except for this to work, you need a lot of good bugs. And making a lot of good bugs is really, really hard. That's why we're starting Debug, a project to develop better technology to raise more good bugs. Technology like bug sorting algorithms, bug tracking sensors, and bug raising robots. That's right, bug raising robots. And with more good bugs in more places, it might finally be possible to stop the spread of mosquito-borne diseases. That way, more people could go to work. More people could go to school. More people could go outside without worrying about getting sick. And bad bugs could be a problem that's just as small as they are. All right. So as you see, you know, there's different approaches for, for mosquito control. And one that is, is coming up, um, um, our lab is, is part of it, is called Wolbachia control. And that bacteria, that the, the, the video shows, which by the way, it's a, it's a spin off of Google called Verily. And we work with them in some of the developments that they mentioned. This good bug, as they say, is mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti, that carry a, a bacteria that is found in another mosquito, which is the Asian tiger that is in your back. And by, in, by transferring this bacteria into Aedes aegypti, the male mosquitoes, when they mate with uh, the wild type, they cannot leave viable offspring. So this is a method that is really revolutionary first because there's no genetic modification. We're just using a bacteria that is naturally occurring. And second, we're exploiting all the behavior and biology of the mosquitoes to really do the work for us. Um, so that method is being implemented in many areas. And for instance, Fresno in California has one of the projects with Verily and my work in, in Puerto Rico that I mentioned is partially related to advising them how to use that method in the island. Um, <clears throat> but the principle is very simple. So you release male mosquitoes, they cannot bite. And what happens is over time, as you see in these lines, so you know the blue lines indicate an uh, area that doesn't get the mosquito releases. And the green one is where the mosquitoes are released. Uh, what you would see is a massive suppression because the process of sterility induced by this Wolbachia process. And at the same time, community support is really really high because there's before release, people were very skeptical after, you know, they just see more things flying, but they're not actually biting them or doing it. Um, now, the way we are involved is because we got funding from uh, USDA, uh, sorry, USAID, as well as other, other partners to develop this method 
of, of control in the Yucatan. And although the robots are, are a fancy, fancy thing that you know has been developed, we're starting with you know the development of this massive factory that is operational now in the Yucatan, where we can grow and rear mosquitoes by the millions, and that's what we do now. The idea is you grow them at the, by the millions, you separate the males, and then you release the males. Uh, in this case, about 5 million of them a week. Um, and we've done this pilot study, you know, the idea of moving into bigger areas in two towns in, in the Yucatan. Um, and of course, part of the, the issue here is how you communicate with people, you know, what good and bad bugs are. So we have a lot of community engagement you know, explaining people what to do and again, engage high schools. It is really a great opportunity to engage communities and not make them uh, in a way just receivers uh, or recipients of an intervention. In this case, they could uh, participate in a more active and egalitarian way um, in the control of their health. Um, and what I'm going to show you is just some results of the first season uh, that we had where we actually have two towns, you know, this one, is a control site, so we didn't do any releases. And San Pedro is the one that received the mosquitoes. Um, and again, measuring you know how many eggs are hatching over time. You know we had a first period of releases, and then over time in the control in the Wabakia area, which is the red, eggs do not hatch very readily compared to the control. So it's a big reduction, over eighty percent. Uh, mosquitoes outside is the same. So you see this line is going down and you get up to 80%. And mosquitoes inside, we're seeing the same. So mosquitoes go down, and by the end of the, the first season, we almost didn't get any mosquitoes inside. So the method is really promising. Um, I show you that I was not going to, I promise I was not gonna take any mosquito, but I don't know if you see my, my camera. You know, if you can see the camera right now, you'll see some flying. These are Wolbachia mosquitoes that we can grow here at Emory, because we have uh, great facilities that we just got built to be able to do that. So, so there's a great potential for work, not only with these mosquitoes, but also the mosquitoes in your backyard. And the idea is to transfer that technology also to Edis Um So where we are now is, again, this is the health minister of Yucatan that I go there very often to visit and, and, and meet with them. And we have full support from all the political actors. Uh, so the question for us, you know, at the end of this talk is how do we do control of a, a, a mosquito that not only is taking on an environment as complex as, as this, but also that is bringing these new viruses into the environment. Um, and I think the answer that I always give is, we have to do that, that control by using multiple tools. So Wabakia well, mosquitoes are great, but they're not going to be solving the problem by themselves. And my lab and, and our group uh, of collaborators, what we do is, we, we bring evidence you know, from scientific studies so we could assess which strategies are going to be successful or not, and if they're not, why? Why, why they might fail? And with some of the examples I show you and many others we're in the works, we're really trying to push the envelope for developing new approaches with the idea that indiscriminate use of insecticides, it creates more of a problem than a solution. So I, I'm, we're not, you know, saying no insecticides at all, actually they have a, a room in, in the toolbox, but we have to be very smart at how to use them when and how to prevent uh, in a way the evolution of resistance if we were to use them. Um, and, and at the end, you know, rational approaches are what we're needing uh, to control. And, and, and just to finish up, you know, bridging, you know, going back to the title, bridging science with policy, has actually been led not only by the data I show you, but also practice. So we have written for the WHO these technical documents, uh, and one that I show you for indoor residual spraying. We have one in how to do interventions uh, uh, in urban areas when we have spatial variability on where transmission happens. And also this one that explains all these well-back methods that we're developing. And the idea is to keep moving forward uh, providing evidence, but also tools for countries to utilize as, as they fight these viruses that keep invading. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll just stop it here. I'd like to thank, uh, you know, not only all my, my collaborators, which are quite, quite large and they're all part of what I'm saying, just, you know, I'm, I'm the voice here, but also my group, my team, my students. Um, I think we're celebrating Mardi Gras there. Um, 
but our undergrads get the, the privilege of, of researching and sometimes traveling even to these areas to do the kind of work uh, we do. Um, and I was with a, a colleague of mine in, in Mexico a, a few years back, and, and he took this photo, which I find it very useful and amusing, right? So this kid having Mission Impossible, um, and he has a mosquito right there, he killed for us. So maybe it's not a Mission Impossible, we have to find uh, better tools and approaches to achieve our mission. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's very interesting. And we'll open it to questions now. No hands. I'm surprised. Oh, I have the wrong hand. Ah. There's my hand. Oh, we can't see it on the background. Okay. Well, do you have a question? I do have a question. There are, I, this was fascinating and I, and I love the, the work you're doing. It's, it, it's, it's nice to turn the mosquitoes against themselves. I see signs in my neighborhood of don't spray because it affects pollinators. Would you comment on, on what we should be doing instead? It sounds like we're not doing the right thing in Atlanta. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I mean, this is an interesting, uh, you know, I've been trying to get funding uh, to do the kind of research here in our backyard that we need to do to control Aedes albopictus. It's a nuisance mosquito in Georgia, so nobody would give you the funding to research them. But we've been doing it on the side, you know, with my students. Uh, and the evidence is this. So, so the, the, the companies, Atlanta is the second largest uh, city in terms of per capita investment in, in backyard mosquito control. The first one is Los Angeles. Um, so there are many companies and, you know, I'm not, you know, we have to do something if we want to be outside. Um, now, the problem is that many of those, at least the companies I've seen, um, what they do is something called barrier spraying. So they go with a machine uh, with a product, generally it's called bifentrin, it's a pyrethroid, and they spray all the perimeter of your yard. Um, now, most of what I've seen, them, actually one of my neighbors, uh, was, you know, had a company doing that and I, I explained it and she actually stopped and is doing something different now, but um, most of the areas they spray are not areas where the mosquitoes are found. Because the Aedes albopictus mosquito is primarily going to be found in dark, moist places. So if you have a deck, they're gonna be resting under your deck. If you have ivy, English ivy, they're going to be resting under the English ivy. And you don't see those companies going and, and so they, they take on your bushes and plants. And because of that, my concern, and, and we have some, some study, we have done some studies with the mosquitoes and there's evidence of incipient resistance. So the mosquitoes are starting to evolve resistance to these chemicals. Uh, but what happens is not that much of what it does to the mosquitoes, that is very little, but it's what it does to non-target species. And you know any insect that is resting on that, plant at the time of application is going to be affected. What happens is in the tropics, you know, those track mounted control, control is done generally in the early, early morning and the evening. Uh, just because that's when the, the, the people are in their houses and they would open the windows. Here in the US, we don't do that. So if you go in the middle of the day with a cloud of insecticide, you're more likely to impact a pollinator. And in urban areas, the impact, there's some evidence, especially for airplane spraying that has been done, the impacts could be quite large. Um, now, what do you do instead? Um, number one is the mosquitoes exploit natural and artificial containers. So we can take care of the natural containers. And one of them is bird feeders. Um, so you have to keep them clean regularly. If you let them accumulate for about a month, mosquitoes are going to grow there. Um, there are products that you can buy that if you put them in the bird feeder would actually control the larva there. They don't, they don't take care of um, you know, the airborne part of the, the mosquito. And then in terms of what you do in, in, in your yard, you know, it's don't keep magnolia leaves accumulating. Those are perfect after a big rain, especially if they accumulate water for a long time. Um, and also exercising some personal protection. But you know, the approach of 
doing these massive releases of mosquitoes in Atlanta. It's something we've been, I've been trying to convince people to do it in Emory campus at a minimum. But again, the resources you need to grow and, and raise that many mosquitoes are not there or the interest is not there. So it's more challenging. What about putting per permethrin on clothing to keep insects away? Yeah, so permethrin is, is actually, um, as long as the mosquito, because the first insecticide mosquitoes evolve resistant to is permethrin. Mm -hmm. So the, if you go to the, for instance, you get that cloth and you go to Mexico, well, mosquitoes are going to be resistant. So, so it's very likely that the benefit you gain from the insecticide treated cloth is minimal. Here in, in the US, here in Atlanta, they actually offer a, a, an important level of protection. Um, it's just whether people, some people get sensitive, you know, to the, to the, to the, again, you have a, a chemical. I bring this up because I told this group last year, I'm a dermatologist and talked about insect repellents and how valuable yeah. it was. And I thought that the spraying the shirt, getting a, a sun, sun resistant shirt so you don't get burned and having it permethrin treated, which lasts for six weeks, one treatment uh, is, is pretty benign for, yeah. for your skin. Anyway, let me let other people talk. Thank you. Uh, Larry Bogor has his hand up. Yeah, so uh, my question is, uh, what about uh, birds and bats that eat mosquitoes? I mean, uh, if you eliminate all the mosquitoes, are you going to affect those species? Yeah, that's a very important question. So at least for the, what I can tell you is this. So, so in the urban ecosystem, the mosquitoes that we're trying to control are invasive species. If anything, what they do is they exclude native mosquitoes, which are not even a problem for humans. So the tiger mosquito, I don't know if you know the story of the Asian tiger mosquito. So the black mosquito that bites you uh, in, in, in your back here. It was first detected in the US in 1985 in New Orleans. And since that time, propagated all over the, the US. So if you were, in, in Atlanta, prior to that time, you had other mosquitoes that would be affecting you, but not the Asian tiger mosquito. So when you look at the ecosystem and you look at the mosquitoes and, and what eats them, what the, 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 the agreement from, from us and from scientists is that in urban areas, they're not really occupying uh, such an important niche that if they're gone, the whole ecosystem will be gone because what they do is actually exclude other species. Um, so in the tropics in Mexico and other areas is the same. We have about 30, 25 species of mosquitoes. We're only controlling Aedes aegypti, some of these methods. Um, um, and the other one is uh, people have tried to, to, to control them for a long time. And the only thing we're going to be doing is reducing them. That idea of eradication is, is quite difficult to achieve um, for multiple reasons. So. Um, the concern from a biology, and now I'm talking to you as a biologist, the concern is that because these are invasive species, um, places, for instance, like Australia, what they're trying to do is prevent them to invade to begin with, so they don't get the disease or the problem. Now, given we have them, we have to find ways of managing them so we can, in a way, lead the way to other species that are the ones that natively were the food uh, and the pollinators of the plants. So I assume the bacteria that infect the male mosquitoes are, uh, doesn't spread to other species of mosquitoes, is that correct? Well, it doesn't, but also the bacteria that we're talking about is, there are two bacteria. So Wolbachia, there are two strains of Wolbachia. One is found in the Asian tiger mosquito that we have outside your yard. And that's why one of the reasons why Mosquito um, fights the viruses differently. The bacteria benefits them. So the bacteria is out there in the system already. And the other one is W. Mel, and it comes from Drosophila melanogaster, the, the fruit fly. So both bacteria are already in the environment. They're actually, if you have a rotten, you know, a banana that goes bad for a couple of days, and you see those tiny flies, all those flies would have a back in. So, so that's a different approach compared to what we call genetic modification, where you're modifying the genome of a mosquito to be sterile. And with that, you could transfer those genes potentially um, in, in a different way through the system. In this case, 
Spiders are already eating mosquitoes with that bacteria because it's in the environment. The only thing is putting it in a new organism. Okay, thank you. Okay, Spencer. Uh, well, that was great. I, I truly enjoyed it. Uh, don't, uh, I'm curious about this uh, uh, mesh that confuses a mosquito. That sounds very attractive. Yeah. But how far is that away from commercialization? Um, so, so this, I don't know if you can see it. So it's, this is the, the, the product. So I know that uh, it's all about patents. So, so Sumitomo Chemical owns the patent on these and they're deciding whether they're going to renew it or not. And I think next year it goes off their patent and then any company could develop these devices. Um, but you can find it commercially at a lower dose in something called the off clip-on. S.C. Johnson develops that. The difference is that this one has a higher dose. What we found is that the clip-on is not as protective. But we hope that within a year or two, you know, that the, once this issue with the patent comes out, you know, it will be developed. The, the, the good news is the, the molecule is cheap and, and any other company could, what they're doing here is getting a polyester fiber is really clever. So it's a polyester fiber that it's been built with the chemical inside it. So this creates a slow release fiber and that's why you can touch it and it doesn't smell or anything. Um, and the technology to do that now is becoming more available. So, so I would say, we hope that by creating the evidence, you know, we have an article that is coming up about uh, Edis Alopictus, <clears throat> creating the evidence going to gain more market, but um, you know, there's something in the market is out there and the off clip on is, is the closest one. Well, that's that technology is very familiar to some of us. I'm a cardiologist and that's the same thing for the drug eluting stents where the pollen, where the drug is in the polymer and gradually releases. Yeah. So, let, let me tell, uh, this has nothing to do with science, but, but uh, since we're at Emory, my secretary at Emory for 30 years was the great granddaughter of a man from New Orleans. who was a vascular surgeon. He was sometimes called the father of vascular surgery. But uh, the thing that got him on the centerfold of uh, the Times Picayune as a man of the century was that uh, Rudolf Mattis, that was his name, was uh, in engaged with uh, Gorgas and, uh, and uh, Walter Reed and his people when they enabled the building of the Panama Canal and so forth. And he took this to New Orleans and uh, they credit him with uh, kind of uh, controlling uh, yellow fever in, in New Orleans. And so this is a, this oh. is a human interest story, Rudolph. Yeah, Mary. and if you're interested, there is a really good book, if any of you is interested, it's called Yellow Fever and the South by Humphreys. He's, he's a Harvard professor, I believe. A historical epidemiologist, and, and she describes what's fascinating how the history of the public health system in, in the US emerged from yellow fever outbreaks in New Orleans and Savannah, the main ports. Actually, the, the whole idea of quarantine came from quarantining ships before they actually made it into, into the shore. Um, and when I teach students you know, about the history, they, they mosquitoes and diseases are something, you know, global health, right? So looking outside our country and our very own history, including where the CDC is located, um, is really linked to mosquitoes. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, that that was like, sound like a great Christmas present for my former secretary. So I'll look for it. Ah, absolutely. Okay, Gray has his hand up. Okay. Um... Thank you. That was really interesting. And uh, clearly there are advantages with Wolbachia in that it doesn't require any genetic modification and it's already existing and so forth. But there is work being done with gene drive in mosquitoes as a way of control. And of course that does involve genetic modification. But I just wonder what your feelings are about that type of research and whether it should be continued, it has promise or not. Yeah, no, very good question. And, and I was, again, part of some of the advisory boards we are, we have to evaluate multiple um, tools. Um, so honestly, the, the, the biology behind 
genetically modified mosquitoes is fascinating. Um, so one of the transgenes, what it does, it basically creates flightless females. They, they knock down the flight muscles of, of the females and then they cannot fly. Um, there is a company called Octech, which developed you know, a lot of the, the, the technology behind and that they're actually doing releases in Key West right now. Um, so the idea is they release these uh, female mosquitoes, um, they do their thing, and then the offspring, you know, if there is a wild type mosquito, it's going to be uh, flightless. Um, now, the challenge they had, honestly, is community acceptance, not scientific acceptance. And when you're looking at, a, at such a widespread problem, a global problem, you know, 80% of the world lives in an area that is affected by a mosquito and, and the estimates of, of risk in, in billions of people is amazing. The challenge I think I see with GMOs is that countries have set so many rules that the technology is always going to be lagging, even if it works. And the evidence, at least from the data that I have seen, there's no evidence. Um, it was a paper that it was challenged that they were saying that they found the transgene in spiders, but it was very sketchy in, in how it was done. So the evidence so far says, if you release the mosquitoes, it's not propagating into the food chain as a transgene. But the problem is politically, the same way that if you go to a, a place and you say, let's use insecticides or let's use vaccines. So, so many of these interventions see a pushback. GMOs, the reason why innovation and research and development is lagging it's not because of lack of interest, it's because they get it to a really great scientific product and it's, it's where implementation is what, uh, you know, challenges. And just a last minute comment, well, back it has its issues too. You know, the bacteria confers a fitness cost to the mosquito. It could be small or big and we're quantifying that. Um, so if you release males, you might have to constantly release them because maybe they, la they leave couple of days less than, than the wild type ones. And that's why I'm not saying the future is just releasing mosquitoes. But I think with GMOs, my, my belief is that I love the biology and the science, and I have issues with how um, the policy of implementation goes. And one of the guides that I mentioned that we wrote for WHO is exactly that. We are pro providing countries all the steps they need to achieve for not only releasing Wabake, but releasing a GMO. You know, what barriers, what type of uh, monitoring tools they need. And the problem is, well, they need a lot of infrastructure they don't have, you know, so. Thank you. Nancy, I believe you have your hand up next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, we don't hear much about Zika anymore. What happened? All right, um, so Zika, um, First of all, it's, it's not like COVID, uh, although it evolves rapidly, uh, it doesn't have strains, you know, uh, as, as we're seeing now with these variants. Um, so what happened with Zika is really burned to the continent. Uh, we did a study in the Yucatan uh, with pregnant women, and we got a 30% infection rate, which means like in a, in a month, you know, in about the whole season, we got like a lar really large um, fraction of people uh, infected. Um, so what I'm telling you, and that's part of what I'm doing as advisor for PAHO and WHO is, so in our Mexico study, which involves children, these past, you know, we had COVID and COVID impacted everything. People are not going out. The transmission was slow, but from the few cases that we got, more than half were Zika. So my prediction is Zika is going to make a comeback because it's going to follow this cyclic nature of naturally induced immunity in the human population, then they go down. They actually could be maintained by mosquitoes themselves. So a mother mosquito can infect their babies. So Zika could be you know, persisting in the system at low level. But in the Yucatan right now, in our cohort, about 25% of kids are seropositive. So we have 75% of the population who are susceptible, at least for children. Um, so our prediction is, is going to come back. And I'll tell you, it's going to come back and countries are going to realize they forgot all what they learned about how to control mosquitoes because 
COVID erased all the all the gains and all the infrastructure. And second, we're still not there with the right tools. You know? well, thank you, Gretchen. Um, hi, I too want to say thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Uh, actually, well, I've, I've got multiple questions, but I, I'll re restrain myself and ask just one at this point. Um, I'm, I'm aware of, of people who claim anyway that mosquitoes just don't bite them, uh, you know, uh, and, and others who say, you know, any mosquitoes come directly to me. Uh, is, is it true that there's uh, any difference in the attractiveness of human beings uh, yeah. to mosquitoes? It is very true. And actually, um, that's called, we call it heterogeneous biting. And the idea is if you plot a, a graph, you know, uh, in, in our group of people, a histogram, you're going to see that most people attract on average, you know, some mosquitoes, but a few of you are going to be attracting a lot of them. Uh, what happens is heterogeneous biting is the other factor that influences why outbreaks are so widespread because it just takes that person to get infected to then having all the mosquitoes to bite them. They're like super spreaders of, of infection. And we have some work that we've done in, in, in the Amazon describing that super spreading on, on dengue. Um, now, why? You know, my daughter is like that. You know, she's an eight year old and I, I feel like I have a personal mission of controlling mosquitoes because she doesn't like to be outside, you know, <laughs> when, when there's a ton of mosquitoes. And we do, we do, you know, try to minimize their numbers. But the reason why is not truly no, although we have some evidence that for children, you know, or at least the pediatric population, body surface matters. You know, oh. body mass, body surface. You can be tall, um, body temperature matters. If your core temperature is a little bit elevated, um, breathing. So, you know, one of the reasons why pregnant women are very attracted to mosquitoes is because, of course, as, as they are going um, into the breathing, you know, changes, you know, of course, having, uh, you know, a fetus in, in, in her belly. So, so that changes how much CO2 they expel and how attractive they are to mosquitoes. Uh, but there's one more <laughs> that at least for Anopheles mosquitoes, it was found, which is bacteria in your skin. Um, so mosquitoes, the tiger mosquito and there's Egyptian mosquito, it's going to be really hard to have a bunch of mosquito bites on your head. They sense the CO2, but they don't bite on your head. They're going to be biting your legs, your ankles. And some studies, again, very rough, they have done is just have people wear socks and then <laughs> in a trap and see how many mosquitoes they attract. And they found that the bacteria and octanol and some chemicals that the byproduct of bacteria generates might be responsible for more attractiveness. Although there's no particular strong evidence of exactly what chemicals, because it's not one, but the truth is if you know who attracts more and you know what are mosquitoes responding to, you can knock that down. So there might be ways of, you know, in a way addressing uh, attractiveness and maybe developing the next generation repellent. Um, but for right now, what we know is <laughs> what I told you. Yes, and, and uh, of course you said in the course of your talk that uh, mosquitoes will go for mammals. Um, but much prefer human beings. Um, I'm just wondering about the extent, though, to which um, mosquito-borne diseases are an issue for other mammals. Well, keep in mind that uh, we have two types of, of diseases, what we call the human-human, you know, in which you need a mosquito, a human, and then the mosquito has to bite another human. And then we have zoonotic. Vector oh, yeah. And zoonotic means you have an animal reservoir. So I did 10 years of research on West Nile virus. And for West Nile virus, it's birds and mosquitoes, the ones maintaining the, the transmission. And then humans are almost an accident. We get it because a mosquito bites us, but we cannot transmit the virus back to the mosquitoes, right? Um, Zika is assumed to have a zoonotic cycle. So it might be remaining in some areas in Brazil in monkeys, 
Um, there are other viruses that are even more scary than, than Zika called Eastern Equine Encephalitis. I think, you know, some of you going to the, the Panhandle in Florida, um, you know, Alabama and, and Central Florida, it, it's a different type of mosquito. Uh, but what happens with that virus is it kills about 30% of people who get it. And it's very spotted where it happens. But again, zoonosis, it's just persisting in the environment. And the mosquitoes, by an accident of biting us, they could pass. So, so for, for most of what we care about, malaria, dengue, those are human mosquito humans. So we, we can get rid of the, the zoonotic element. Mm. I have a question that I held off asking. I react and get quarter-sized welts from mosquitoes. And the past few years, I've been using um, pyrithium and in a misting system that sprays a short dose, like two or three times a day in the ivy, and I can be outside. Is that something that's appropriate to con use to control them? Yeah, that's the mister, mister, one of those. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so those are, again, it's, uh, it's almost like having your own sprayer, right, in, in, in the house. It's just that, um, it, it does. So, so the bottom line is, so, so the pyr any, any of those pyrethrin, you know, probably uh, related to pyrethrins, um, depends where the sprayers are and what's the extent of the cloud, the impact they're gonna have. And again, it's the same as put it in the environment. Um, so one of the things that uh, we've been researching is that, again, hopefully we can get, get some funding for that. It's like, you could actually apply insecticides in the ivy, but instead of doing it as a misting, as a this residual, like I was showing you for, for, um, for, for Aedes aegypti, this TIRS, and that's called barrier spraying. What well, we found, that's what I do in my house. I don't go to the flowering plants. I go to a couple of ivy places, spray them, and the future of that method is we're going to create some targets that attract mosquitoes. So instead of you damping the chemicals out there, you lure them into a target and then you kill them. So these residual insecticides, because they last much longer in the environment for a month or two, in a way they imply less application and less exposure to one target. But the problem is companies won't do that. A couple of reasons. One is more visible to go around and show you that they're doing the work or the misting system. Uh, and second, it requires some knowledge of biology of where the mosquitoes are. Um, yeah, well, uh, my house is completely surrounded by ivy, so I know yeah. it's a setup, but if I get rid of the ivy, I lose my erosion control. Exactly, yeah. So, but I'm glad to be out without, because I could be out no more than 10 minutes without getting chewed on. Yeah, I agree, yeah. And Gretchen, I see you have your hand up. Yes, me again. Uh, Yes, okay. Um, I have, had not realized, I'm kind of horrified to discover the extent to which mosquitoes inhabit indoor spaces uh, and breed and bite indoors. I, I assume, I, maybe I shouldn't assume this either. I, I'd always thought of them as, as an outdoor threat, but is it uh, in, in countries where windows tend to be open without screens? I mean, I don't think of it as, or is it a, a threat to us indoors here in Atlanta uh, and generally in the States as well? Yeah, so yeah, it's a good question. So, so most of the, at least continental US because Puerto Rico is, is, is different. Uh, yeah. So the mosquitoes we have are really outside and outdoors and air conditioning lifestyle is one of the, again, I remember being in a Gates Foundation meeting and we were talking about crazy ideas and somebody says, let's give air conditioning to everybody and we solve the mosquito problem. <laughs> we were joking, but kind of joking because lifestyle is what actually prevents mosquitoes to get into your house. And having screens and then air conditioning, of course, uh, the two combined, um, that's a lot. So we, we generated a lot of, again, I didn't have time to show you, but we generated evidence about the, the protection you get from screening. And it's huge. So, so even in tropical areas like in Mexico, if people were to have screened doors and windows, they would have 70% less mosquitoes and infected mosquitoes compared if they don't. The problem is cost. So what we're doing is we got funded by the Canadian government to actually go create a, a, a commercial, not commercial, but a, a do-it-yourself kit of house screening. 
And what we're doing is screening doors, and instead of using a frame and all that, we use magnets. So people open and then the thing closes in their back and super cheap, you just glue them. And we're trying to work with companies and I've been trying to get a habitat for humanity involved because again, it's, it's a sustainable development need to be in, in an area with no mosquitoes and no disease. But house code in the tropics doesn't include a simple practice like washing your hands, having screens in your doors and windows. So the evidence we generated is quite strong, but policymakers are very hesitant because it means who provides that, right? So you cannot go to Mexico and Mexico would say, let's put screening in all doors and windows. What I've been trying to push is, especially in Puerto Rico saying, well, there's money coming from the hurricane relief. Oh. FEMA and, and some of the housing contracts should have screening. Puerto Rico has tens of thousands of dengue cases you know, um, you know, when there's an outbreak. Um, and there is a point where these things could actually line up. It's just that as a single intervention, it's really hard to push, but as a do-it-yourself, uh, government um, subsidized housing uh, tool, it is really simple and effective. Good to know. There are no other questions. I want to thank you again for uh, doing a very interesting presentation. I think that one that everybody can relate to. We've all encountered these creatures outside. And I know moving to Atlanta, I seem to encounter them more often than other places where I've lived.